So why don't we, um, we have sort of a, a handful of people that um, are going to give a little presentation. Um, and you know, all of this is in the background of the trillion dollar nuclear weapons escalation, which of course, depending on who you ask, is $1.2 trillion now. Um, if you include inflation, it's $1.7 trillion. Um, so it's a huge amount of money. Um, that's over several decades. And of course, this is, these are resources that could be going elsewhere in our society. Um, so we're going to keep it to about 10 minutes each, if that's okay, and we'll sort of flag you um, just so that we can get everybody in. Um, and so first is Gary Goldstein from Tufts, who's going to talk about weapons and warhead modernization. Yes, so what is it that we are expanding and modernizing? The, uh, the nuclear arsenal, and if you ask uh, what part of it needs modernizing, if you look at what the plans are, everything, everything you can think of, from uh, submarines to cruise missiles to things that were never envisioned to be part of the nuclear arsenal. Uh, to understand how this works, it's best to go back to the general big strategy, which is called the triad. The triad essentially consists of the three branches of the military, the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force. Each has its own nuclear-capable systems distinct from one another. And among those systems, we can separate the warheads, that is, the nuclear bombs, from the delivery systems, missiles, uh, planes, etc. And among those systems, we also have the division between the delivery systems that are funded by the Department of Defense and the warheads that are def funded by the Department of Energy, uh, which is also the, the branch of the government that funds energy and environment research. A lot more of the money in the Department of Energy goes into nuclear weapons than it does into uh, energy and environmental research, especially now that we know this. So, <clears throat> when I say everything is included, there are particular items that are worth pointing out because they are new uh, and will essentially make for a less stable situation. Uh, I want to talk about three different uh, distinct weapon systems that are part of the modernization program for which the funding has already gone out uh, to Raytheon, to Lockheed Martin, to Marietta, formerly this Lockheed Martin now. Uh, the money is, is going out there. $900 uh, billion dollars promised for different upcoming uh, modernization programs. But <clears throat> among these are particularly uh, worrisome extensions of what would become a nuclear war. There is something called the B-6112 guided bomb. This is something new. It hasn't existed before. And it is a tunable yield nuclear bomb. That is, by adjusting some switches before sending it off uh, as a guided bomb that is, has its own uh, propellant system, it can be tuned anywhere from about one tenth the Hiroshima size bomb yield up to almost 50 times that. It's incredible. Um, this is the dream of some people in some think tanks that are supported by, by the Department of Energy. Uh, <clears throat> that's one thing. Another is the long-range standoff cruise missile. Now, cruise missiles were invented uh, decades ago. They're kind of the precursors of drones. They're like fighter planes with no pilots. And they're capable of delivering nuclear bombs or conventional bombs. They're used uh, 
nowadays to deliver conventional bombs. They can be launched from submarines, they can be launched from planes, and they can be launched from mobile uh, kind of trucks that move around and are hard to keep track of. So there are aspects of uses of cruise missiles that fall into each of the three military categories. Uh, ground launch, called Glickums, air launch, called Alcums, and submarine launch, called Slickums. And these were acronyms that were around 20 years ago when uh, there was a lot of concern in Europe, especially about the placement of these bombs, uh, of these cruise missiles. So they, they were pulled back a bit. And there is an intermediate range missile treaty that uh, limits their implement, their use, and their, actually, their deployment. Nevertheless, in spite of that treaty, this is now being pushed forward as a new tool in what could be what is seen as a limited type of war on the ground between Europe and Russia. So, very destabilizing. And of course, when, when the news gets out about these kinds of weapons, the Russians respond. And they say that they're modernizing as well. And if you saw uh, Putin a month ago show, demonstrated somehow, film or what, the new arsenal of weaponry that is being uh, built and, and that will counter the U.S. efforts to uh, build what are called battlefield or tactical nuclear weapons. So it's a big escalation of the, the uh, standoff between the Russians and the U.S. And we are indeed in a Cold War kind of arms race. It's happening. <laughs> so those are, yeah. Then there is a new kind of fire plane, the F-35 fire plane, which is capable of carrying a nuclear bomb. <clears throat> I had slides here to show you of these things flying around, but don't have, don't have to. Uh, but yes, these are just fighter planes, one pilot carrying a nuclear bomb that can be like an alchemy air launched cruise missile, the cruise missile can be launched from the fighter plane. And the fighter plane is a stealth plane uh, that is in phase radar as much as that can happen. So again, this is a new kind of threat to the, the other side, whatever the other side is, and contributes to the distrust between the two sides, the Russians and the US, and maybe the Chinese as well. <coughs> so when I say everything is included, there is also going to be a whole new family of submarines. Submarines, incredibly expensive things. Uh, by the way, the uh, that B I never remember the number. B-61-12 guided bomb will be the most expensive nuclear weapon ever built. It's already going to pre predict it to be over $4 billion to build a handful of these things. So incredible, wasteful expense, dangerous. But then we have an enormous number of ICBMs. That are I, see, I think it was the the, uh, uh, the, the, the bomb isn't that expensive. Did you mean the long range standoff missile? The long range, yes, that's the, expensive that's the one. Oh. That, yeah, I've got the one backwards. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The long range standoff. Uh, then, uh, right, there are 450 ICBMs in silos that will be replaced because they're old. We have to replace old missiles, who knows? Well, there, there's been a program throughout all these years where the 
it's called LEP, I forget what it stands for. Life Extension Program. Thank you. Which, <laughs> which uh, takes these old ICBMs and refurbishes the trillium that's in the warheads and makes sure that they still operate. Uh, that goes on, but what is going to happen is they'll be replaced by a completely new system. New expenses, new money for the military, uh, for Lockheed Martin, for Raytheon, for the Department of Energy, contractors, uh, spreading the wealth. So in one sense, while making the world less safe, uh, it's going to make the military industrial complex even fatter. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much for that. Um, so, so you covered a lot of the basic points that I was going to make about why it's generally destabilizing to be making meaningful technical improvements to our nuclear weapons because, first of all, I mean, it just, that's, at least arms race dynamics very directly. When we improve our weapons in terms of their ability to target or their long-range accuracy, and when we have a long-range system like the LRSO, it leads to concern um, in our rivals, and it almost always leads to them conducting their own build-ups, their own modernizations, and their own improvements, um, and that causes further insecurity in the United States and further arms racing. So I'm not going to spend too much time talking about that basic concept. Um, what I'd like to do, if you guys don't mind, is get a little bit in the weeds about um, some of the detailed and most recent developments in um, the pr proposed modernization, um, specifically under the recent nuclear posture review. So um, as some background, every time a new president is elected since the, I believe the 80s, possibly 90s, actually I think it's 90s, for the last few decades, um, every time a new president is elected, they have conducted a nuclear posture review where the Department of Defense looks over the existing United States nuclear weapons policy and states its position for their term. Um, so this year, there were some meaningful changes um, as compared to the Obama administration's nuclear posture review. And the ones that are most concerning to uh, people working in the area of disarmament in the NGO community in DC are a few specific weapon systems that are going to be introduced. Um, one in particular is very near term, and that's the uh, proposal for a low yield warhead on our submarine launched ballistic missiles. Um, so we have these Trident uh, missiles that are launched from submarines. Um, their greatest strategic value is that submarines are very difficult to track. So. Those um, weapons are very safe from a uh, preemptive strike from an opposing, from an enemy. Um, so that's the main reason that we need, that's the main reason that is given for why we need submarines. Um, but this idea of having a low yield warhead on a submarine is troubling because it plays very much into the possibility of a nuclear war fighting mindset. Um, especially because of the reasons given in the NPR this year. Um, and some of this is informed by things that are not in the document of the NPR, but that have been said by its authors and by representatives of the administration in different events that have taken place in DC over the last two months. This is something I've been following very closely. The basic justification that's being given for why we need to have a low yield weapon on a submarine launched missile is because Russia might think that if they attack, if they do further aggressive actions in Europe, they might think that they can use a small, low yield nuclear weapon to secure their gains without facing uh, a response from the United States. And the reason that is being said that they might think that is because they have very good air defenses and our current low yield weapons are delivered by air. We have a low yield um, gravity bomb. The B-61 has a low yield option. Um, so that can be delivered by a uh, dual capable fighter aircraft or a heavy bomber. Um, but it has to fly over its target to drop the bomb. The idea there is that Russia's air defenses may in the future be so good that we can't reliably do that. Um, 
could you define your role you? Absolutely. That's, yeah. It's a very important question, and it's one that has not been publicly answered by the administration. They've been directly asked many times um, in public events, in congressional testimony, and they refuse to give a number. In, in, in fact, uh, low yield is anywhere from what the, the, you were saying about the dialable yields, mm -hmm. anywhere from a tenth of a Hiroshima bomb to, uh, my understanding is it's up to a hundred times the size of a Hiroshima bomb, mm -hmm. and that's all ye low yield. Yeah, that, that <laughs> because because what potential. what's on the on the in the minute mans and the submarines uh, now mm -hmm. are are uh, warheads that are several hundred or a thousand times the size of uh, Hiroshima. Yeah, the total, um, the total maximum nuclear payload on a Trident missile exceeds um, two megatons, which is, it's hard to even have a frame of reference for that. It is uh, like a thousand times, over a thousand times in total. That's multiple warheads. But the submarine is capable of carrying multiple warheads. Um, so this, one of the main issues is that, um, well, there are a lot of issues here. Um, <laughs> to get back to the low yield point, so they refuse to say what they mean by low yield for this specific warhead. And it makes a big difference because the argument that they're making is that if we do this, if we have a low yield warhead on our submarines, then Russia won't believe it can use a nuclear weapon and not have any consequences because they'll know that we will just use our submarine launched ballistic missile to target um, a target of importance to leadership in Russia. It, that's <laughs> roughly an exact quote. Um, and it's very vague, very unclear what that means. But it clearly means that they want to launch a nuclear weapon into Russia, um, or they want to threaten to launch a nuclear weapon into Russia in order to prevent Russia from taking aggressive actions in Europe and solidifying those potential gains with their own <coughs> low-yield nuclear weapon. The logic here is extremely convoluted. It doesn't work. And the main problem is, it can't even choose a main problem. One of the main problems is that um, it's resting on this idea that the United States would use a nuclear weapon in Russian territory in response for Russia using a nuclear weapon on the battlefield. Mm. And somehow, they think that won't lead to escalation. It would. It would lead to a nuclear war, almost certainly, yes. Presumably, this logic is that they couldn't just use one of the big ones, because that would be more likely to lead to escalation. Yeah. So this is something that is less destabilizing. That's the idea, but it doesn't work that way because if we try to make it more realistic, that will... <sighs> That's the argument that they present, absolutely. Um, the problem I have with it is that Russia is not, I don't think, suffering under the delusion that they can use nuclear weapons and not face a response from the United States. I think Russia is very aware that if they use nuclear weapons in any context, there will be some sort of response from the United States, and it will most likely involve nuclear weapons. I, I think that all of American history would point in that direction. Louisa, can I, yeah. can I interrupt Absolutely. for a second? But yeah. if I, let me get this straight. Uh -huh. <laughs> they think that they think that Putin yeah. mm -hmm. would actually think, yeah. um, gee, um, I can get away with using one of these, you know, Tenth up to a hundredth times uh, Hiroshima bombs, mm -hmm. uh, by because I want to take over Paris. Right. <clears throat> okay. And Donald Trump won't hit me over the head with a hundred megaton weapon. That's, yeah. They think yeah. Putin thinks that. Yeah. Or <laughs> and so one of the issues that I have, and this is a personal thought, not something I can back up with research, but. It really seems like these people don't even believe what they're saying. It seems to me that they're just reaching for ways to justify more weapon systems because what they're doing here is they're trying to find a technical weapon solution to a perceived deterrence gap, but deterrence is 90% about credibility. It's about the relationships between the two countries and believing in US will to use nuclear weapons. It's not about having the very specific West weapon system that's able to reach into Russia despite their air defenses. I mean, Russia's logic is not based on thinking that the United States can't hit them with a nuclear weapon. Quite the opposite. They know that we can, just like we know that they can. And that's what really drives deterrence. So the logic that's behind the low-yield submarine-launched ballistic missile um, 
is this idea of tailored deterrence that we need a very specific capability to respond to every individual potential threat. And it's, I think it's a dangerous way to think about deterrence because it leads us down this path of needing more and more nuclear weapon systems. You see it consistently throughout the NPR um, and it, it's troubling and it's destabilizing. So I focused in great detail on this one weapon system. There are a couple of others that are mentioned in the NPR, um, including a potential low yield, also undefined uh, submarine launch. Sorry? Um, do you think our military really believes this rationale, or do you think that it's a cover for some other motive? I don't think the military believes this rationale. Okay, then is there another motive? Yes. Um, I think that, don't quote me on this, because I need to back it up with research before I can say something uh, definitively, but there are people who are involved with the drafting of the NPR who have uh, for decades been pushing for more weapon systems, more advanced nuclear weapons. Um, they're referred to in DC as the nuclear priesthood. Small group of people who have very strong views that nuclear weapons are the solution to most of the problems facing us. Um, and it seems to people who are in DC that that group of people has had a much greater influence over this nuclear posture review than they have over previous, um, although they've always worked very hard to exert influence in DC through lobbying. Um, so I don't think that this nuclear posture review reflects the actual uh, logics of the US military. I think there are other forces in And then do those people have a different motive than what? Well, financial. They work for the. You don't think it's just for some kind of first general war fighting, nuclear war fighting capability? Well, I think. Um, that's a really good question. I think that the move we're seeing towards nuclear warfighting logic is probably uh, more driven by the fact that these people want more weapon systems and a denial that those weapon systems move us towards nuclear warfighting. I don't think they're actually trying to fight a nuclear war, and they repeatedly say throughout the NPR that we're not going to do nuclear war fighting, this isn't about nuclear war fighting. Um, but then when you look at what they're putting forth, it moves us in that direction. Thanks. Yeah, the, I mean, it really seems like the actual motivation perhaps is, you know, you start with the idea of we need modernization, which I think is a term of propaganda. They want escalation, they want new systems, um, and they're sort of retrofitting the, the policy. Yeah. So I really appreciate that. So. so uh, I, was, uh, I wanted to put my two cents in on the last discussion first, and that is that uh, I read uh, a couple of technical briefs on some of the new uh, warheads uh, and weapon systems, and if you read that, uh, it's kind of like, you know, uh, the kind of thing you would see in a request for proposals or, you know, these d dense little concise descriptions and things. And they, they specifically discuss the warfighting uh, um, objectives of a <coughs> given weapon system or a given warhead, and uh, which implies that the weapons are being designed to be used uh, as weapons, not to be not designed to be used as in diplomacy, so to speak. Uh, but I think it's very simple to understand. Uh, and I think it's basically, it's, it's not that it's happening right now, it's been going on for a couple of decades, but now it's really being finalized and capped off with this new generation of nuclear weapons. And that is the transition from MAD to uh, nuclear war fighting. MAD, mutual assured discretion, uh, actually was a fairly accurate description of what was going on because uh, at least up until a couple of decades ago, uh, uh, all these intercontinental ballistic missiles, they were accurate to like two or three hundred yards. Uh, in order to take out a Russian missile silo, you'd have to have a, a, a blast so large that it would just simply take out a little piece of the planet. And, and just a, a fi a five or six of these, according to the new research, would be enough to bring on a nuclear winter all around the planet. Just the level of insanity is pretty high. But, uh, so that is mutual assured destruction. I mean, it, it was, it's just, 
these massive warheads. Uh, and so that pretty much deterred both sides from doing anything because there was no in between. I mean, it was, you know, uh, and, uh, but now this new generation, right, you can have, uh, you can design, and, and instead of two or three hundred yards accuracy, I mean, it's secret, so maybe the accuracy has improved somewhat now. The only people who really know, the only people who really know work right across the street here in Draper Labs. You know, they're the ones who design and make all these guidance and control systems. They're the only ones who really know how accurate they are. Uh, but supposedly now the new generation nuclear weapons, instead of having accuracy of two or three hundred yards, depending on a couple of things, will have an accuracy of uh, uh, three or four meters or under certain circumstances, ten feet. So you don't need a huge warhead to take out a specific kind of a target because you have the accuracy that you need to put the blast where you want it. Uh, and that, of course, means also you, you drastically reduce collateral damage, you know, instead of wiping out in a, <laughs> the entire area, or perhaps the whole planet for nuclear winter, you, you can just knock out what you want to knock out and not not destroy a huge area all around it. And Why do you so, have to have a nuclear explosion to knock out a facility? Because they're underground, oh. hardened and so on. Oh, they're uh, underground. Yeah. So uh, you have to go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but so the, that's the whole thing is this, the, these weapons are designed for nuclear warfare. That's what they are designed to do. And because you can limit collateral damage so much, it makes it so much more attractive to actually use them, you know, in battlefield situations. So I was asked to talk about the companies that we want uh, people to divest from. Um, and uh, the nuclear establishment uh, is all uh, privatized, uh, but it's divided. Uh, sort of operationally and property-wise, so to speak. Uh, uh, kind of half of it's in government-owned facilities in the Department of Energy uh, nuclear weapons labs, and the other is just the private companies producing things just like they produce the planes and the submarines and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, uh, in the seven primary uh, government labs, there's uh, about 50,000 people working, uh, uh, and mainly working on nuclear weapons uh, production and maintenance and, and uh, operations and so on. Uh, so in, uh, it, it's interesting that, uh, where is this? Um, in, the, in the seven big nuclear weapons labs, that the, uh, most of them have three or four companies that are in a partnership and they, they have the contract from the government to run the lab. And they do everything. The government does nothing. It just pays the money to the private company that they've hired to run the lab. Well, sometimes there are, they may have little, some little government pockets that they negotiate that we want the, some Air Force guys to do something in your lab for, you know, the, but it's basically just all done <coughs> by the private companies. Uh, one company, uh, BWX Technologies, formerly Babcock and Wilcox, uh, is in the partnerships that run five of the seven nuclear weapons labs. So it's by far the preeminent company in the operation of the nuclear weapons lab, uh, BWX Technologies. Um, where is it? Uh, uh, Bechtel, you know, the giant international construction company, you know, Bechtel, uh, and Honeywell International and AECOM are three companies, each of which man, uh, is involved in the partnerships running two of the labs. Uh, and then uh, a few other companies are involved and they would be in the partnership that runs one of the, one of the labs. So one lab is sort of unique, it's only run by one company, and that's Sandia and Lockheed uh, runs that uh, all by itself. Uh, and um, let's see here. And, uh, just Who runs Los Alamos now? Uh, Los Alamos is AECOM. Uh, wait a minute, where is Los Alamos? Yeah, AECOM, BWX Technologies, and Beck. And, and they've been running it badly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, that's the same uh, for Lawrence Livermore. 
the two sort of key at the scientific level labs are run by the same, each lab is run by the same three companies. Uh, the Nevada National Security Site, which is also where the testing of, uh, used to be done of all the blasts, uh, that's AECOM, CM, CH2M Hill, and Northrop Grumman. Uh, the Y12 complex, BWX Technologies and Bechtel. The Pantex plant is just BWX Technologies. Uh, Savannah River is BWX floor, Honeywell and Huntington Ingalls. Uh, Pantex, I said, is BWX. Sandia is just Lockheed Martin, and Kansas City is just Honeywell. Um, so there's actually eight companies that uh, run all, all of the seven key national weapons labs. And uh, uh, we were trying to get an article published on Lockheed, which we failed to do so far, but it was interesting in researching it. I discovered that the head of uh, of Sandia Lab, uh, and which uh, is not a Lockheed, uh, which is a Lockheed employee because Sandia is a subsidiary of Lockheed. I mean, the, the Sandia division that runs, you know. well, that same guy is the head, uh, I've forgotten the name of the Department of Energy division that runs the labs, the National. National Nuclear Security Administration. There you go. So, the National Nuclear Security Administration has a department for a government employees, right, of each of the uh, of these weapons labs. Well, the guy that's head of Sandia, the private company running the lab under the government contract, is also the head of the government division that gives the money to Sandy the lab. <laughs> Talk about a conflict of interest. Have you ever heard of anything like this? Mm -hmm. That's the sound of the and, 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 <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, I, and, I, and I and I found out uh, that that was the case, I don't know if it still is, for two other of the other seven plants. I mean, that, that's how, but that's how how it gets when it, it, when you live in the world of government secrecy, right? It's all national security, all the rules somehow they disappear like magic. You can get away with anything uh, if you're, uh, you know, under the rubric of the So can we find this information on, like, uh, the Institute for People's Engagement website or anything like that? No, or? no, because the Institute for People's Engagement uh, is, uh, I don't know why Jonathan put that down. Uh, it's, 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 it's just it's a little under umbrella. Develop. It's okay. a little umbrella. Yeah. It's under development. You're just giving me the name for you and some friends. Yeah. yeah. You can find it. It's not, it's not hard to find. You can find this on Wikipedia. Well, I'm just hoping to see, you know, you've consolidated it so well. I'm just hoping, you know. I, 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 I intended to, to bring all hand ups for all of this, but both of the uh, both of the photocopy shops I went to on the way here are, are, are not open on Saturday. Well, if you send it to, if you send it to uh, one of us, I will. we can at least circulate it among you know, the people that are on the list. Great. Okay. I will be happy. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Uh, on the. Um, on the uh, other side, uh, the, the, just the nuclear production done by the companies, not via their contracts with the nuclear weapons lab. Uh, there's 12 companies uh, that do most of the work, and uh, the most important ones are the ones you would guess anyway. They're, they're, the, they're the biggest military contractors in general, not just in nuclear. You know, it's, it's Raytheon, Boeing, Lockheed, Northrop Grumman, you know, these are the which do they do they mean the design the delivery vehicle? Yes. Okay. Yes. And the other group that you mentioned before designed the actual war. Yes. Okay. Yes. And there's some crossover to, right. to some extent, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, now, uh, so, can so, we, so if, if you don't mind, we have to move on to Peter, mm -hmm. um, if that's okay. So, yes, it is. Um, so, I, ju I just just let me say one thing. Yeah. That is that uh, just like there's. Uh, a lot of crossover on the on the uh, Department of Energy side, where uh, one company might be in the partnerships running two or three of the labs, that kind of thing. Well, the same thing is true on, on the other side. In other words, uh, the Minuteman missile uh, uh, doesn't just involve you know one major company. All all, all of the four majors, uh, they're always involved in all all of the big weapon systems. So. 
uh, if Lockheed has has the contract uh, for uh, the Minuteman missile, or you know, then all the other the Raytheon and Boeing and Grumman, they're going to have a piece of that action. They're going to be subcontractors in that, and uh, that's the way it works on all of the systems on the submarine system, the air system, and, and so on. Company. It's not a company, it's, it's, the, it's N, the government, the it's, N, the, it's, NSA. it's NSA. Okay, it's the division within NNSA that's responsible for running the Sandia lab. Okay, that makes sense. And, that's, words, and, the, and that grants the money under the contract to, the to Lockheed to, to operate the Sandia lab. He's his own regulator. Yeah, 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 he's his own funder and his own regulator. Um, right. I don't recall. Right. So, because of these sorts of conflicts of interest and the sort of, you know, the military industrial complex and the revolving door, we end up with some fabulously high costs. You have to let me say one more yeah, thing. Yes, sure. And I'm sorry to say it's, it's the worst thing of all to say. These guys have it all planned out, uh, and they do it jointly. The companies do it jointly so that every state in the Union has got a nuclear weapons plan or five nuclear weapons plan. You know, they've got their self-interested pocket every single way. The, the, and the other thing that makes that actually, it's not just the nuclear weapons. No, nobody says that the money for Lockheed's F-35 jet is part of the nuclear weapons spending. That's not part of all this money we're talking about. <coughs> but it's, it's a dual use plane, right? It can do either nuclear or technology, or, or regular conventional weapons. So it, in fact, is also part of the of the uh, nuclear weapons. And and so it's not just the nuclear weapons plant in your state that is a source of lobbying for nuclear weapons money. It's also the, the plant that makes parts for the Lockheed plane because Lockheed puts out the word, you know. I mean, you know, we want, we want you, you don't make nuclear weapons, but you better be down there uh, in Washington lobbying for XYZ, you know, because this is a dual use system. And, okay, sorry. That's okay. So, um, yeah, that's the National Labs uh, is owned and operated by Honeywell. Um, and then their money comes from the NNSA, who's head of both. Um, <laughs> we end up with a situation where we have a fabulously expensive um, escalation that they keep calling modernization. So Peter Casey is going to talk a little bit about the, the money part of it. Right. Um, I'll kind of give sort of a, a fairly general summary, but I do want to follow up on a couple of things. One, with regard to the uh, national laboratories, it is a club. Is a big club and it's a revolving club. These partnerships have th these contracts, by the way, thirty-year contracts. Right? These are not like they're awarded and then they're com competed on every year. That's just not the way they work. And when these partnerships dissolve, they compete for uh, other contracts that come up, and they consist of the same club. So it is a big revolving door. And um, fifty thousand people working in these laboratories. Do you know how many employees there actually are for NNSA? The, the government agency that's supposed to be responsible for this, 1,200 by law. They can't have more than 1,200 people. It is, in fact, a joke. The whole idea is to turn money over mm -hmm. to the contractors, let them do what they want. It's outrageous. Um, um, but um, I do want to mention the something, I do want to talk a little bit about the, the what's now being uh, described as a $1.7 trillion um, campaign, and I would call it for nuclear proliferation because that's exactly what it is. Um, you $1.7 trillion, you hear that in, in the abstract, you can't really figure out what that means. So to contextualize it, let me, let, me, let me contextualize it the way Congress and the military will contextualize it. They'll say, well, outstanding debt now in the United States is $20 trillion. And this year alone, we had a trillion dollar, trillion dollar deficit. And over the course of you know the next 50 to 75 years, we're going to run a, a 50 trillion dollar deficit in terms of what we're paying for social insurance, Social Security, and Medicaid. So what's 1.7 trillion dollars, right? It's a drop in the bucket, right? <laughs> Why get all worked up about it? That's not the point. And Bill Harding, I think, made the point this morning. As the nuclear weapons 
industry and um, agenda goes, so goes the military industrial complex. It is the leading edge. It is historically the reason why we have a military industrial complex. And I think Bill captured it perfectly by saying, or observing, as it was said and understood back then, um, we, um, in the nuclear age, we have to have um, enormous conventional military weapons systems and armies because that it's because uh, we can't afford to shoot these nuclear weapons that they have. It's insanity, but that's the way it works, and that's the way that it's been exploited ever since. So I think if you look at it in that context, the $1.7 trillion isn't just $1.7 trillion. It's what we, uh, what you could somehow factor in the totality of military expenditure or the, um, the, the, uh, the um, multiplier effect, as it were, that it will have on the uh, military quote unquote investment that is made of our money, the public wealth, by the Congress of the United States. Congress of the United States, of course, is not an independent body. It is run by the private interests, predominantly the military industrial complex. I don't think that anybody who seriously looks at the way these people behave uh, these days can come to a different conclusion. All of the most progressive people in Congress, Liz Warren, all of them out there saying, oh, they're progressive for this, they're progressive for that. And they are the first people to vote yes on the, uh, the NDAAs and the, the money to appropriate uh, for, for the military. So um, they are um, completely captive to this industry. I lost it. Um, the, um, just generally speaking, though, short term, this year, $700 billion for the overall military uh, appropriation. $700 billion. It's the largest ever in the history of the United States. Uh, next year, it's going to break the record. It's going to be $720 billion, uh, setting a new record. Some context for that. Um, U.S. accounts for about 4% of the global population. Our military spending uh, constitutes one-third, one-third of all military spending. Um, we spend more than the next 10 largest military spending nations combined. Um, and as Bill said this morning, about more than half of what is appropriated for the defense industry every defense for, for the Department of Defense every year is in fact given to contractors, private contractors. And the amount of the money that the government gives every year to private contractors is more than the combined military budgets of Russia and China combined. So um, think about that for a minute. Um, uh, this, I think, it's pretty, if you look at history, this all started with the maddest of all inventions. It started with the nuclear weapon. Um, growing out of the Manhattan projects, what really did set a new paradigm for this country and policy in this country. And it was basically, though, I think, things, the three things that stand out are, number one, a mindset that we had to become the most dominant destructive power on the planet. Number two, cost is no object. Number three, who can guide us in the use of this force? Who has the expertise in the military? Those three things are combined, and I think have clearly set the path for this country's policy since then. Um, one thing to think about, too, and there was some discussion about this briefly at the sessions this morning, but uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War. Well, what happened? What happened? Where was the peace dividend? It didn't materialize, and the reason is it didn't materialize because the forces that are behind Congress don't want it to happen. Um, military industrialism, it's like an addiction. All right? These guys and these people and this culture there are addicted to it. And I think, again, the spending on nuclear weapons is both a symbolic manifestation <coughs> of that as well as a driving force and really the engine, the engine that allows all of these companies to get behind this in the way that they do it and uh, to, for Congress to go along with it. Um, the, um, the modernization, misnamed modernization, which is really escalation of proliferation program, um, is already fast uh, on, on a fast track. Okay? This is not something that's going to happen down the road. It's going to get much worse down the road, but it's in place right now. The contracts have already been let in a big way. And uh, just over the past two years, and I take this from uh, Louise's uh, association, who was the only association I could find that managed to seem to be able to parse the budgets be able to figure out what's that because Congress, the government won't do that. They won't tell you what we're spending on the nuclear mission. But as best it can be discerned, 
The budget for 2018 for the nuclear weapons proliferation mission is about 26, uh, 20, uh, let me see, about 26 billion dollars. Okay, next year it's going to go up to 36 billion dollars. So you've got a, you know a one-third leap already there and attributable to the proliferation project. Um, with regard to the 1.7 estimate itself, that is not at all reliable. I mean, it, it, it's, uh, and, and by that I mean it's gross, a gross understatement of what just, if you just looking at the nuclear weapons themselves, it's likely to turn out to be. First of all, um, it's, it's, uh, that's based on something that the Congressional Budget Office did with last year. Now, what's the CBO working with? The CBO is working with budgets given to it by the Department of Defense and the Department of Energy. And we know how reliable those are. Okay, they're not reliable at all. They're a lot of fiction. So first of all, they're working from a lousy baseline. You might ask, well, why don't they look at the historical spending? Isn't that really the place we should look when you want to set a baseline for calculating what the likelihood of, of a, a forecast is going to be? Isn't that what any actuary would do? Isn't that what anyone making a, a pro forecast would do? Here's the problem. There aren't any records. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. The Department of Defense has no reliable records of its historical cost for anything it has spent. What? No, no, yeah, what? Yes, that is a fact. For the last 25 years, the every year, this is published information, the uh, Comptroller of the United States says the Department of Defense Got a Let me just finish this. Got a few more minutes. <coughs> Got to be back by 145. Every year for the last 25 years, the control of the auditor in general for the United States government says, we don't know what the financial numbers are for the United States. Why? Because nobody knows what the costs are. Actual spending has been by the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense doesn't know what its checkbook at the Treasury looks like. It doesn't know how much it's spent. It doesn't keep historical records. There are records kept. There are receipts as it were, but there's not in any reliable form that can be aggregated into anything that resembles a reliable financial set of financial books and records. They don't exist, so there's no cost basis there. Um, and there's never been an audit of the Pentagon well, or the there, Fed. There's never been, a, not all, there has never been, a, well, there's not <coughs> putting aside the Fed, there's never been, for that reason, an audit of the Pentagon. But this year, they are coming, they are trying to blow you away with the most nonsensical eyewash and say, we're going to audit the Pentagon at the end of 9-30-2018. By law, there has to be an audit. If you read the fine print, what Congress actually says is, give it your best shot. We don't really <laughs> believe you're going to be able to do it, but, you know, make it look like you, you go through the motions, spend a billion dollars, <laughs> spend a billion dollars on Ernst & Young, uh, KPMG, etc. this year, and then come back and tell us how bad it is. There's not going to be any audit of financial statements, so that's just that. Long-term effect, um, and this is where people like me um, are always looked at as being a curmudgeon, all right? Because I am convinced, looking at <coughs> what the United States government says every year, what the Comptroller uh, General says every, every year, and what the reasonable analysts say every year, what the trustees of Medicare and Social Security say every year, that this country is facing without any question, a very serious crisis for Social Security and Medicare within the next 10 years, all right? There's no question about it, in my view, all right? Now, again, though, that's dismissed as curmudgeonly because people say, well, you know, you can't really tell, and, you know, these are all just sort of pessimistic projections and so forth. I don't think so. I think that the path is pretty clear as to where things headed. The the, the cuteness of the debate that goes on in the military community over nuclear weapons is this. Oh, well, if we, if we have to spend so much on nuclear weapons, that means we're going to have to cut back on our other weapons programs that we all have to modernize and proliferate too. So that by 2025, they call it a bow wave. The bow wave is going to get. And uh, there's going to be like two waves, nuclear spending and then spending for all these other modernization weapons systems. Uh, Coming, coming to a head. And sacrifices are going to have to be made. Something's going to have to give, and we're going to be, at, you know, that's going to be a, put the United States people at risk. There isn't going to be any sacrifice. The sacrifice is going to come from every single one of us in terms of our Social Security benefits and our Medicare benefits. All right, so let's all pay attention to that and try to do our best to prevent it. It's 135. 
Uh, on that note, 